All right, good morning, everybody. This is Chad Smith with the Chad Smith team and with The Real Solution. We're going to go through a webinar today on how to get your offer accepted in this crazy market. I've got Brooke Summer and Jason with me, Jason Breitenstein with me today. So who's going to benefit from this webinar today? Basically, anyone that's working with motivated buyers in this crazy 2021, heading into 2022 real estate market. And in case you're curious, what is the real solution? Well, basically, we are a hundred million plus a year real estate team actively growing our business in the Dallas Fort Worth market. And we're also expanding a network of agents across the country and actually outside of the United States through eXp in our uh, real solution network. And um, what this means to you guys is that we are actively operating in this market. So a lot of webinars, a lot of coaching and training in real estate is done by somebody who was a, uh, a big shot back in 1989, or maybe their claim to fame was selling REOs back in the 2008 market. But we have act actively grown our business and we are growing our business. This year is the best year we've ever had. And so that's why this... Um, Webinar is important to you, and that's what the real solution is. So on the call today, we've got Jason Breitenstein. So Jason and I got into business together back in 2013, going into 2014. Before that, he was a regional trainer for a new home sales company. He was in that industry for 13 years, and he is now the director of sales for the Chad Smith team. And just last year, he himself sold 100 homes in 2020. Jason, how's it going this morning? Hey, I'm good, Chad. How are you this morning? Doing great. I'm glad you're here. All right. And then we've got Brooke Summer. Brooke Summer has two master's degrees, and he was actually working at the World Institute of Politics. Uh, whenever I met him in Washington, D.C., he moved back to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex and joined the team back in 2012. So we've been working together for a while, started on the operations side, and is now the director of lead generation and an agent on the team. And uh, has now generated over $250,000 in gross commissions four years in a row. So, Brooks, welcome. How are you this morning? Thank you, Chad, uh, for having me. I am doing excellent this morning and uh, excited to be on this call and to help uh, agents out there work to master this market. Absolutely. Well, you guys are, are really important to me. Um, we've grown a lot since we got into business together and we're just getting started. So I think we're going to be able to help a lot of people today because this is what we actually do to win. You know, we've closed, um, it, we've averaged at least 25 buyer transactions per month for the last four years in a row. So this is real, this is relevant. And if you're listening today and you're ready to pay attention and take action, it's going to help you out. And a little bit about myself. My name is Chad Smith. I got licensed all the way back in 2004. Our real estate team here in DFW has closed over $100 million in closed sales volume just in the last 12 months. And then also um, founded The Real Solution, which is basically, we've taken all our culture, our belief system, our skills, and our business systems and put it into a playbook. And now we're partnering with agents all around the world and giving them access to that through our network. So um, excited to be on here today. Let's jump into it. This is what we call the eight stages of a real estate business. So over on the left, um, everybody gets in the business. They've never closed a transaction before. So they're, they're what we call a solopreneur. And what that feels like when you first get started is that you're lost and um, you're all alone. You're trying to figure out what's going on. And most people don't have access to a mentor who is one of the top in the industry. If you fell forward and you work your way through the business all the way over to the right-hand side, that's when you're closing 300 plus transactions a year and you're really looking to build additional businesses and create new opportunities for the people who are on your team. And uh, each one of the stages kind of talks about the people you hire, the challenges that you are dealing with in each of those stages, and then how to overcome them. And this next slide I'd like to show you is the actual track record of our team just so you know um, on this call that you're talking to someone who's actually done it. So you can see, I got into the business there in 2004 and straight through the meltdown, we continued to grow coming into the seller's market. We continued to grow. Um, and then the four stages you see there, identify, commit, lead, and simplify are the main mindset shifts that I made to grow the business. And that's how we organize all of our training in the real solution. 
All right. So how to get your offer accepted in this market? There are a handful of business assumptions that we're going to lay out as we give you the, the action steps. So the national average um, for real estate agents is that the average agent closes about seven transactions per year. So that's about one transaction every two months. And then most agents do not have access to top level training. And I already mentioned that, but I'll say it again. Most real estate offices either hire someone who maybe sold a decent amount of homes back in previous markets. You know, maybe they were, maybe they uh, peaked in their career in the early 2000s or even in the 90s or even in the 80s. Um, or someone is kind of volunteering to teach in the office, but they actually haven't even, they're not even valid yet. They haven't actually gone through the steps to build a massive business, but they're just kind of volunteering to teach. Well, most agents only do a few of the necessary steps for each of the key activities in real estate, even if they get the top level training. And so we're going to come at it from a little bit different direction today because we're actually, not only have we done it, but we're, we're doing it right now. And so this is a myth that most of us have faced at one point in our career. Uh, over on the left, this is where you are today. And you have this goal of, let's just say, closing one transaction, if you've never done that, or if you've closed two in a month, maybe your goal is to close four in a month. And what the trap we all fall into is we think we're just one step away from our goal. And to use the buyer analogy for today, a lot of us think if I could just find a super motivated buyer, a cash buyer, ready now buyer, all I had to have to do is just pick them up, put them in my car, take them to a, a, a house that's on the market, write the offer, and the next thing you know, I've got a closing. But the reality is, is that it looks more like this. We all think we're one step away from the goal, but the reality is that there are all kinds of dozens, maybe even hundreds of little things that we could do differently. And if we did those things differently, we would actually achieve the results that we wanted. So let's look at what it takes to actually get an offer accepted in this market. And it starts before you show the house to your buyer. And so remember, you are in control of your business and you choose who you spend your time with. And what I mean by that is, are you taking the time to qualify the buyers before you go show houses? Have you asked the questions? Have you gotten them hooked up with a great lender? Do you know their motivation? Do you know their why behind why they're going out to, to purchase a new home? And so it starts before you ever go show a house. And uh, let's jump into number one here. So Jason, let's just say you have identified a motivated buyer and they want to go look at houses What's the first step you take that helps you stand out amongst all the other agents? Yeah, Chad, that's a good question. So one of the first things that I'm going to do is call the agent before I go to show the house. I want to make sure that the house is still available. Um, the goal here is to protect my time and my client's time. And one of the worst things you can do to lose credibility is actually get a client out into a house. They fall in love with it. They want to buy it. And then you find out that it was actually sold about four hours ago. Um, then you're backpedaling, trying to salvage uh, your, your relationship with the, with the client. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, let's say you actually do get a motivated client. If you don't do this homework ahead of time and then they miss out, or let's say they miss out on two or three or four, they could begin to question your professionalism. And, you, and, and how much you actually know about the market, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's say uh, you call and there's a handful of houses that are still available and you get out to the house and they really like one and they, 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 you know, they think that this is the house for them. Let's go to step two. Well, what's, what's kind of that extra effort that you put in that helps you um, really start to, to be strategic for your client and really start to help your client uh, distinguish themselves away from the other buyers in the market. Yeah. So Chad, this is probably, in my opinion, the most important step that I do. And this is where I begin to build rapport with the listing agent. So I, the minute my buyer is in the house and they actually decide that, you know what, we like this house, we want to make an offer. I'm going to call the listing agent while we're in the house and with my buyers on speakerphone. And I want to find out the details that are important to the sellers. So I'm asking questions like, you know, obviously, other than price, what's important to the sellers? What are they looking for in an offer? 
Do they need a quick close? Do they need more time? Do they need to lease back? Generally, the listing agent is going to tell me uh, what is really important to the sellers, and I'm going to be able to put that into the uh, into the offer that we write. Um, the other thing that I'm doing here is that while building rapport, I'm also uh, working to get the the listing agent to actually tell me what it's going to take to win. So in the event that my clients are not making what I would consider a strong offer, meaning that maybe they're coming in at asking or they're coming in very, very lightly above asking, I'm going to actually ask the listing agent. Um, so we're thinking about making an offer of this blank. And is that something that you uh, would like me to send or would you like me to not waste your time? Oh, that's fantastic. So so it's almost like a trial close. You're trial closing the listing agent and you're doing it from the standpoint of protecting the listing agent's time. That's exactly right. So the listing agent is obligated to present every offer that comes in. And by putting it that way, hey, if you know that it's not going to even have a chance, um, I'm helping you protect your time and not have to present that one. Normally, the agent will actually start to tell me things in this, this area that are going to help me uh, teach my clients how to think about winning and building an offer to win. So a lot of times the agent will tell me, yep, no, don't waste your time. We've got offers way above that. So it allows me to go back to my buyers and say, okay, you heard it from him. It's not me speculating anymore. We have to raise our offer way up if we're going to have a chance at winning. Now, the other side of that is if my offer is going to be a very strong offer, I'm going to ask the agent, hey, do you have any other offers on the table? Do you have any, uh, any deadlines set for submitting? And they say, yeah, we've got a handful of offers. Deadline is tomorrow at five. And as long as there is even an ounce of life in that agent, meaning that they have even a little glimpse of personality, I'm going to drop a joke and, and try to get something to make them laugh. And I'm going to say something along the lines of, that's great. Well, go ahead and throw all those offers in the trash. I'm going to send you a better one. They chuckle. I chuckle. And then I say, no, seriously, I'm going to send you a better offer. All I'm really doing here, Chad, is I'm working to set myself apart from the other agents. Just like everything else we do in writing the offer, I want them to remember me when it comes to presenting. And I want them to remember that I'm going to be easy to work with. It's awesome. So I, I want to recap for everyone that's really paying attention on this call. You're calling the agents. You're making sure the home is available. That's a proactive step. You're in the house. Your clients like it. You're calling the listing agent while they're, uh, your clients are standing there on speakerphone. You're, you're figuring out what it would take. You're finding out what the, the, maybe the needs and the wants are of the, of the seller so that your buyer can craft their offer in a way that would help your buyer win, which is ultimately your fiduciary responsibility. But you're doing this all in a way where it's not combative, but you're actually building a rapport with the listing agent and all designed to be strategic to help your client win. It's really great stuff. Yeah. Great job. If I ask directly, what's it going to take to win? Most times they're not going to tell me. If I, if I go through it this way, a lot of times they tell me exactly what I need to write in order to win. Awesome stuff. All right, so let's move on to the next stage. Now we've got to write the offer. So we're, we've got some extra steps, some action steps to take before we write our offer. And remember, you're in control of your business and your goal is to be strategic on behalf of your client. So you're doing this in the best interest of your buyer client. All right, so Brooks, we're going to write an offer. We've got to make sure that we identify what it's going to take to win in this market. And if we, if we just run a CMA that, and look back at the last six months and just grab the average price per square foot and then write the offer, um, our chances of winning are going to be very, very low, right? Exactly, Chad. Yeah, this market is moving so fast because there's so little inventory. Uh, recently, we looked at it and it was about one and a half months uh, for most of North Texas. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at 90 days worth of data. And the main reason why is because that's currently where the market is. Actually, the market is a little bit quicker than that. It's 
really in the past 30 days. So it's, it's right. what's pending and it's what's just recently gone under contract. So what we're doing is we're setting up a CMA that's going to start off in the neighborhood and it's going to look at a 90 day window. Uh, and we're going to really focus on pendings and sales, but we're also going to look at what is currently under contract. And so we're going to do about 10% plus or minus the square footage. And we're, looking at what data is there and seeing if we need to expand it to see what's going over. Because, you know, some of these neighborhoods, you go one street over and there is less activity. And so you're going to want to pay attention to that and really know the area where you're going to be writing the offer. Now, we're going to be looking at specifically at those pendings and the active options. And we're going to go in and we're going to call the agents on those to figure out what what it took for the accepted offer to win was it where were they in price and you know what what we're going to do is we're going to congratulate the agent on on their listing on getting their listing under contract and getting it to this point and we're going to let them know why we're calling that we we end up having a client who's about to be making an offer and that we are working to help our client win and we're working to figure out what it was. Was it the appraisal guarantee? Uh, was it a full appraisal waiver? Uh, was it uh, the amount that they went over? What, what, what were the specific terms that helped the um, agent choose that offer that they are currently working. And we're going to try to get as much information as we can that the agent is willing to share. And we're not going to push hard, but we're, we're definitely going to ask uh, as many questions as we can. If they won't tell us directly. Then we'll say, well, was it 10 to 15 over? Sometimes you can end up getting more information by starting off way high and then gauging their reaction. Was it $25,000 over? And, and then seeing what they say. That's awesome. And again, I'm, I'm going to keep emphasizing this. None of these steps are rocket science, but all of these steps combined are what give you as the agent a more complete picture of what's going on in the market so that you can help your clients get what they want. So this is, this is really great stuff and these extra steps. So now we've called the agent before we've shown, we've called the agent uh, that listed the home while we're in the house We've reviewed a more uh, market of the moment market analysis, and then we're calling the agents that have pending and listing uh, listings in the MLS that haven't closed yet to get a better idea as to what is happening right now in this market. And that's what's equipping you to write the offer that will win. Okay, so the next step. Hey, Jason, Chad. Once, yeah, once we've gone through all that data, we're calling our client to review it with them. And the way that we leave them before they tell us where they want to go on an offer is we make sure that they understand if there's multiple offers, that there are multiple offers. Mm -hmm. And that once multiple offers happen, they are no longer dealing directly with the seller. They're dealing with the buyer that they will have no idea who they are. They will have no idea how many homes that they've missed out on, how motivated they are, what they need to do in order to get a house. And so the buyer has to now make an offer in which they have to be comfortable with whatever the outcome is. And so what we like to tell them is, is you want to make an offer where if the house sells for $100 more, then you knew that you were good with not getting it. But you also want to be good where you get it. You don't want to make an offer where whenever it is accepted, you regret that they accepted your offer because you went higher than what you really, really wanted to. And so it's a needle to thread, uh, though they have to understand that they've only got one shot at this. And the uh, listing agent is going to work with the offer that has the highest likelihood of netting their client the most amount of money with the least amount of hassle and um, that 
there may be a little bit where they're looking for an emotional appeal, and we'll get to that here in a second. But I do think that at the end of the day, that those are the main things that a listing agent is looking for. They're not looking to have a low appraisal and then have to go back and renegotiate um, a contract when their seller thought that they were going to be netting a certain amount of money. And now it turns out that they may not be netting that amount of money. Uh, so the agent is working to make it easy on them and easy on the seller. And so that's what we're setting our client up to understand in regard to the offer that they are making. Okay, that's really great. It's such a great uh, dialogue for setting expectations with your client. You've done all your homework. You found out what's going on in the market. Then you've educated your own client on the market. And then you're having this conversation and you're threading the needle. So you don't want them to overpay and have regrets. And you don't want them to write an offer below um, what they're comfortable with and have regrets for missing out. So you, you give them, you deliver the information, you give them the script of let's write the offer that's your best offer to the, to the point where if someone else were to buy this home for $100 more, you would know that this is not your home. Because you're at the threshold of what you feel comfortable with and you would not have regrets over. And if someone else gets the house, that's probably a good thing because you don't want to go beyond that. And so it, again, you're looking out for the best interest of your buyer because you don't want them to overpay. And you also don't want them to sell themselves short and not write their best offer. So great work there. And then right along with this dialogue of, of writing the best offer you can, you immediately partner with your lender who then helps build up this offer. So Jason, what does this look like? So Chad, this, this actually goes back to the buyer consult. This is where this really starts explaining the importance of using a lender who actually can help us win. So I want to partner with a, not only just a good lender, but someone who is very proactive. I want them to be willing to follow up behind the offer and actually call the agent, text the agent, email the agent, whatever it takes to explain to the listing agent the strength of my buyer. Um, I want them to go through the process of we've looked at all their documents. We've pulled their credit score. We've, we've checked and verified income um, as opposed to we just had a conversation on the phone and they told me they make a lot of money. Um, <laughs> A good lender will actually a lot of times be able to extract more information from a listing agent than you will as an agent. Um, a lot of times the listing agent will just start to tell them exactly what other offers look like and what we're up against and what it's going to take to win. So at the end of the day, the, the lender that you partner with is part of your team. If you're an individual agent and you don't have a team, believe it or not, you really do because the people you surround yourself and the people you connect yourself with are your team. So having a great lender, having a great title company, having a great inspector, these become extensions of you and your team. And they actually, they're speaking for you, whether you know it or not. Oh, that's so huge. And this was, this was a game changer for me as I grew the business. Inevitably, when you get started in the business, you, you end up with the lender that um, is also just getting into the business or whoever showed up at the real estate office is um, free lunch or whatever. And um, inevitably, if you're, if you're working with a lender, home inspector, title company that is, is, they don't have more than enough and they're not also partnered with the top agents. If there's a challenge, they tend to come from lack or they tend to blame someone else for the problem. But when you work with the best of the best, they want to maintain that, that um, reputation. And so they'll go, they'll take the high road and they'll take ownership of mistakes and they'll, they're more, um, they usually have the business systems and they're willing to be proactive. And if you're brand new, or if you don't have a bunch of experience, having a really uh, proactive lender and home inspector and someone with a great reputation, it automatically levels you up because you're working with people that maybe even have more experience than you. So this is such a big, big thing to have a lender that's willing to do this, that actually gets all the documents and pre-approves versus pre-qualifies your buyers, and then is willing to call the listing agent and help you win. This is, this is massive. Brooks, do you have anything to add on this? Yeah, uh, the builders have already figured this out. That's the reason why they require you to go with their lender 
They want to know someone whose opinion they believe and actually who they can trust uh, before they accept the, a contract because they don't want to have this big investment on building a house for someone only to have them not close or close on time. Right. So what you need to figure out quickly in this business is who is a good lender, whose word is good. When they tell you that they can close a file in 14 days, do they close it in 10 or do they close it in 21? If you have a, a, a builder who, or a lender who consistently um, over promises and under, under delivers, you need to get rid of them and you need to find a better lender. Brooks, those don't really exist, do they? Lenders that over promise and under deliver? <laughs> Yeah, there a dime a dozen. There was there was one other thing on there is that they say 14 days and instead they never close it because there's the there's that lender too. So and, and Jason's right. This conversation happens in the buyer consult. The buyer consult saves you time because you're going over do they have the cash? Do they have a good lender? If they don't have a good lender, are they willing to talk to another lender to get a second opinion? Just because what you have to explain to them is that, again, it's about netting the most amount of money with the least amount of hassles for a seller, and the lender can end up being one of the biggest hassles. And so they are the linchpin of this whole process. Uh, and a lot of times you don't find out that they're not worth their salt until close date whenever docs haven't gone out. Yeah, this is such great stuff. And just for everyone that's on the webinar, either live or you're going to watch this um, on, on, a, on demand on a recording, nearly every sentence that is being shared on this webinar is coming from the standpoint of thousands of transactions worth of experience. This is, this is real world stuff. And if you don't, if you just kind of brush off what we're saying, nothing's going to change for you. But if you take each one of these points, if you really take it and then implement it into your business and then top grade who you're working with as a lender or reach out to us and find out who we work with or partner with us and immediately have access to our team, your business will change because I was in big trouble as an individual agent before I learned these things. And then everything changed in my life when I went and got into business with the top agents in my market at the time. It changed everything. They immediately make you look better. So don't just brush these things off. This is These are the real steps that it takes to change your business. All right, so now we're submitting the offer. And there's, there are ways to do this correctly, and there's ways to mess this up as well. So remember, you're in control of your business, and your job when you submit the offer is to be the realtor that you would love to work with. So in other words, one of the ways to do this is have proper perspective and put yourself in the listing agent's shoes and imagine that they have a listing that they're getting 15 offers or even 20 or 30 offers on. What would you want to see when the offers come in? So... Here we go. Buyer to write a letter to the seller. So what does this letter look like, JB? So really the goal here is to invoke emotion. I want to make, or I want my, my buyers to make an emotional connection with the seller. In fact, I tell every one of my buyers, our goal is to make somebody cry. I want preferably the sellers to cry and not the buyers. Uh, but the goal is to evoke enough emotion to make them cry. In the letter, you need to really connect with the, with the seller and become more than just a, an offer. They want them to visualize you um, buying their house. And so a lot of times we say the answer is in the house. As you're looking around the house, the cues and the clues are going to be there. If the uh, if a seller is military, they're going to have military paraphernalia around the house that you absolutely have to pay attention to these things. If there's lots of crosses and there's evidence of religion, you may want to discuss how that affects you in your life. Um, another really good aspect to look for is children. If you can tell that they're, uh, they're, they're empty nesters, they're moving out because they've raised their children and now uh, they don't need this big house anymore. You being able to talk about envisioning seeing your children grow up in there, play in the backyard, go to the school up the street, all those things are going to make an emotional connection with that seller. So 
really pay attention when you're in the house because the answer is right in front of you. Awesome. Now, Brooks, I know you've got a template, kind of a, a, a three or four section um, template to follow to write this letter. What does that look like? Yes. So most sellers have a emotional attachment to their house. So what you want to do is you want to talk about what you have in common. So the first part is going to be the house. That's you, you kind of talk in general terms about the house, what you like about the house. Then you talk about how the house matches what you are looking for. Big backyard for the kids to play, you know, four bedrooms for all, all your kids or that there's, you know, if you're working to connect it with um, maybe their pet owners, that, that there's a nice backyard for the dog. Um, and then you go into talking about your house and how you see yourself living in the, in the house. Cause okay. even though they're, um, uh, getting ready to sell it, they're still attached. And for the most part, most sellers want someone who loves the house at the same level that they do. And that's where you're working to show that you have an emotional connection as the buyer, the same that the seller has uh, with it. And so this is one of the major parts you, you want to win on having a great offer price, great terms, a great lender, and that you end up having that connection with the listing agent, but also that the buyer has an emotional connection to the seller. This is great stuff. And uh, remember, it's it's how many of these can you do? Can you just take everything in this webinar and copy it 100% and follow all those steps. If you're, if you're willing to go through those steps, your likelihood of winning is going to increase significantly. If you only do maybe two or 5% of everything that we talk about in this webinar, probably nothing's going to change. I will make one comment on this particular um, slide, and that is double check with your broker, double check with your board of realtors. There has been uh, some discussion about whether or not the letters will be allowed in the future. As of this recording, I believe that they are where we are located, but uh, just double check. We're not, we don't want to advise anybody to do anything that's unethical or against the rules. I believe as of now, it's okay where we are, but just double check, make sure that this um, particular step is uh, allowed by your broker or the board of realtors that you're, that you're in business with. All right, let's move on to the next one. Submit a clean offer. Um, I can remember receiving offers and getting attachments that were unopenable because it was some strange format or it was a massive file or, you know, you get the offer and the agent sends you 15 different emails, right? And so remember, we're putting ourselves in the listing agent's shoes. And so before we submit the offer, we're going into the multiple listing service. We're pulling up the listing. We're reading the private remarks because many listing agents nowadays have instructions on how they want the offer submitted. You also go into the supplements um, section of the MLS and you grab any documents that they've uploaded, whether it's the seller's disclosure, the survey. Sometimes the offer instructions are in the supplements. You make sure you grab all that, you follow instructions. And then the key here is that you load all the documents completely filled out into one PDF and you submit that. So, um, Brooks, what does it look like when we say completely filled out? What are some things that, that you should do and some things to avoid when you're writing your offer? So one of the things that is like top is making sure that your information as the agent is filled out and that the listing agent's information yeah. is filled out. Because the last thing that a listing agent wants to do is have to fill out the information that you should have filled out when you wrote the offer. The other thing is, is that to protect your client, you need to have all the pertinent blanks filled out and you need to have them filled out appropriately. So if there aren't any closing costs that you're asking for, then you need to write in zero. If you are uh, not um, going to ask for a residential service contract, you need to write in zero. And instead of putting in NA, you need to fill out non-applicable as if it doesn't apply. And uh, so there's all these different blanks on the contract. And anytime you hit a checkbox, you need to have something in all of those blanks that follow. And so I've, I've seen it where agents look at offers 
and they don't want to have to go through contracts 101 whenever they do a counter and they want it all filled out. Now, we understand as listing agents that sometimes uh, an agent may be rushed to meet a deadline in regard to best and final. And so there is a little benefit of the doubt given. But if you have more than enough time, you want to review your contract to make sure that you've you filled it all out and that you've completed everything. And you don't want to send anything in a DocuSign envelope. You don't want to send anything in a dot loop envelope or a link to dot loop because there's so much scams and phishing going on that no one's going to open it because they don't want to make their computers susceptible to any type of viruses. The other thing that is going to be important once you get your offer filled out is that you contact the listing agent to make sure that it didn't go into their spam folder. We've seen this happen. You know, us as agents, we're sending out hundreds and hundreds of emails. And so if one person doesn't like an email we send and they flag us as spam, well, then we may be caught up in spam filters and someone may never see our client's offer and we never and we may never get a response if we aren't proactive of calling the other agent to make sure that they got everything. And so this is the way that I send every single offer. We have an email template put together. I end up having a specific order that I put my documents into uh, dot loop so that I can make sure that I have everything that I need whenever I'm submitting a full and complete offer. And the first place I start looking is in the MLS to see what are the instructions that the agent has for me to complete my contract. And I make sure that if they say that it needs to be one or two percent or one and a half percent for earnest money, that's what it is. If they say that it's two hundred dollars for a five day option period, that's what it is or better. And then I end up having my emotional appeal letter, my my buyer to seller letter. I have the buyer's pre-approval. And then I have the purchase offer, the third party financing addendum. Now, if you scan all of these in, you need to make sure that they all face the proper direction. (laughs) Because the last thing an agent wants to have to do is to print it off and then to rescan it and then to upload it into their document um e-signature set up or have to flip a PDF around because they don't have access to the scanner. Like all of these things are to make it easier on the agent because if they want to accept your offer, you want them to have an easy time working with you as opposed to it being a chore. And, and it also looks professional. Absolutely. Jason, you just shared with me, I think yesterday this exact scenario played out this week and you guys won the offer, right? Absolutely. So we were in multiple offer scenarios um, and the listing agent called me and said, Hey, look, um, you're slightly higher in offer price, but we have other offers that made a full open-ended guarantee. You didn't. Um, You're asking us to pay the title policy. They didn't. You're asking for a home warranty. They weren't. So your offer is not the best, but your offer is the cleanest. And I'm the only one that took the time to build rapport with the listing agent. And for those reasons, we won. That's awesome. And there's awesome stuff. There's been several agents that are new agents that we've trained and that we've shown them how to do this. And they've gotten their offer accepted based upon the fact that it was a clean offer and that it didn't require, like the thing that I hate, is having things with strike throughs and have not having a clean offer when it comes to executing where it's hard to read the offer. And so we've trained agents to do this and the receiving agent, the listing agent has been blown away when they see their MLS number that they're basically a wet behind the ears greenhorn agent and they're writing these super polished offers and then they explain that they work with a team and that ends up setting the listing agent at ease because they know that well i'm working with a professional awesome now we've got this offer we're we're not being lazy to the point where we don't even fill in the co-op agent's information we're doing all these steps we've done all of this And Brooks, you already alluded to it, but our job is to set expectations. 
So we submit that offer and we're, how many times are we reaching out to the agent as we submit the offer? So for me, I'm, you know, obviously I've reached out to find out if the house was available. I've reached out in the house to find out if there's any, uh, anything that the seller's looking for. After I send the offer, I immediately call and text the agent, ask them, well, let them know, hey, just wanted to let you know, I just emailed you the offer. Let me know if you don't receive it. Let me know if you have any questions. And then the next morning, I'm going to reach out again. Now, the goal is not to bug them. I don't want to, I don't want to push them to the point of, of not liking me, but I want to show them that I'm proactive. So the next, that last phone call is, hey, I just wanted to see if you guys had any offer or I'm sorry, any questions about our offer. You know, if there's any changes the seller would like us to make. Um, I'm asking that specifically because I want them to tell me if there's, well, you know, it's a great offer. Thank you. But you're just quite, not quite high enough. Great. What's it going to take? What right. can we do differently that's going to do? So if I don't touch that agent enough times, I don't build the rapport that I need and I'm not getting the answers that I need. It's awesome. So you know, I'm thinking of something that, that we say a lot around here. Hope is not a strategy. Finding a buyer that says they want to buy a house, putting them in, your, in the car, driving to a house that you don't know if it's still available, not looking at a CMA, writing it, whatever offer they tell you to write, um, you know, just hand filling out the, the offer and scanning it in upside down, sending it over, never calling the listing agent one time and hoping that it gets accepted. That's not a strategy. And, and, and I'm not picking on you if you've ever done that before, but that's what this webinar has been about today. All of these little steps are the things that help you know what to do, how to teach your buyer, how to think, how to find out what the listing agent is looking for, how to find out what the seller is looking for, how to be thorough, how to be professional, how to submit an offer, how to follow up with the agent, how to continuously see if you can find out more information that would help you win. And then even as you submit the offer, setting expectations with your buyer that if by chance the offer is not accepted, earlier Brooks mentioned, you don't know, you, your buyer may make an amazing offer, but some other buyer out there just relocated and they sold a property on the east or the west coast for three million dollars and they don't care about appraisals or anything and they make some ridiculous offer and your client wins we've got to do all that we can to submit a professional offer but then set expectations with our buyers that hey if for some reason the door closes on this home and you don't end up getting it that's just all that means is that the right door is going to open in order for us to, to help you find the right house. And if we set those expectations correctly, if we are not afraid to have those conversations, and if our buyers see how proactive we are on their behalf, we won't lose them. We won't lose their trust. And they'll know that we're going through this journey together to help them find the right house. If we do these steps. Right, guys? Yeah, I, I would say don't allow yourself to make excuses. So, you know, the last agent didn't answer your phone calls. We'll call this next agent that you're making an offer on. My last buyer wouldn't wouldn't write the letter. We'll still bring it up to your next buyer about writing the letter. Don't don't cop out because you, you haven't had success in the past, you have the choice from here on out to implement these strategies in order to change your buyer's lives and in turn changing your life. You know, if you help enough people get what they want, you will also get what you want. And so that's the reason why we have to continue to refine our skills. I don't know it all. Jason doesn't know it all, but we're continuing to work to improve, to implement, to, to adapt, to be better agents. And so we're constantly working to improve. I love it. I love it. So I want to move forward here. Everything that we talked about today, every aspect of real estate, you can choose to just do the one step default process that equals seven transactions per year, or you can be proactive and strategic and accountable 
and constantly growing and adapting. And so those are your two choices. And if you're going to build a proactive, strategic, top producing business, you got three choices. You can build it, you can buy it, or you can partner. Um, this Forbes article recently said the exact same thing. If you're going to, if you have big growth goals, you can build it. So that takes time because you got to build it one brick at a time, one person at a time, one system at a time, one sale at a time. And uh, I mean, that's what we did, but it also took time. You, Everybody in the industry runs across people and their, their, their story sa- says, you know, in X number of years, they were immediately this, but none of those people are still in business. Like they're probably still in business, but they're not in this business. They're probably selling you something else, right? To build a sustainable real estate business where year after year, you're providing amazing service for your clients. You're empowering the people. That takes time to build a consistently profitable business. So you can build it. You can buy it, whether that's mergers and acquisitions or even like paying for our coaching through the real solution, which you could do. You could pay for access to our playbook or you could pay for one-on-one coaching. And then the the newer model and, and the reason that we made our transition to EXP is that you could partner. And so through the partnership model at EXP, you could actually have access to our playbook the $100 million a year playbook that we update constantly with our buyer consult, listing consult, our scripts and dialogues, um, the lead generation that we use, everything that we do, we could give that to you for free through the partnership model. So I'll walk you through a little bit on that, what that looks like. If you were to partner with us, there's no commission splits, there's no fee, but if you hung your license at eXp and joined our network, you would get a production kickoff call with the guys that manage our lead generation system. And so they reverse engineer your production goals. They put together your handcrafted lead generation plan, helps you eliminate priority confusion, and they give you a 90-day action plan. They help you set up your funnels that drives leads straight into your account. We teach you how to follow up with those. They They set it all up for you. They set up your websites, your your ads, everything about it. But then in addition to that, our team meets every single day, weekday of the week, Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 9.15. We have a morning meeting and we go through live script practice and role play. We deal with the challenges associated with the market. We have twice a month coaching, live coaching that Jason leads. And then you get access to our $100 million plus a year playbook which means it's just like an open book test on our business. And then the guys that manage digital president in AEA and attract ROI, which is our legion, they have calls every single week that you can access as well. Um, you get access to closed group Facebook pages through the real solution and the honey badger nation, which is the guys that are ahead of us. And the way that you can do that is you just go to realsolutioncall.com and schedule a strategy call with us. So we don't chase, we don't sell, we're just here to help. So you can schedule a call with us and we're not gonna pressure you to do anything. If you just wanna talk to someone who sells 100 homes a year or generates 250,000 plus a year in GCI or someone like me who built and has grown a $100 million a year um, business, Go to realsolutioncall.com and schedule a call with us. If you're actually interested in in buying our coursework or if you want to know more about partnering, schedule the call. We're not going to pressure you. This is the way we run our real estate business. We have easy exit listings. We don't, if someone wants to cancel, they can cancel anytime. We don't push. We help people get what they want and we teach them how to think in order to help them get what they want. We do that with our clients. We do that with our agents and we would do that with you At the very least, we're going to help you with a couple more steps that you need in order to grow your business. So if you want to schedule a call with us and just find out more about us, see how we could help you, go to realsolutioncall.com. That's basically it for the webinar today. Guys, anything to add as we wrap up? The only thing I'll throw in there is that um, success leaves clues and failure leaves clues. So 
who you choose to listen to matters. I agree completely. Brooks, anything else? Yeah, I just uh, would like to say, you know, following what Jason said, your environment is so important. Uh, so whenever it comes to that, you've got to choose the right environment that's going to help you grow. And if you're not in a growth environment, then you've got to take some inventory and think about what it's going to take to get into a growth environment. Because if you go back to that chart A to B with all those multitude of steps in order for anyone to be successful in this business, they have to grow personally and professionally. They have to do things that they would never even think of doing. And then they also have to stop listening to the negative voice inside their head. And they have to make a concerted effort, a conscious, deliberate, ongoing effort to change that voice to something positive, one of achievement and success. And they have to believe it and then take action accordingly. Absolutely. And that's who we are. And that's what we've been doing consistently for 17 years. Well, guys, I just want you to know I'm grateful for you. Uh, I mean that, you know that, but I want to, I want it to be on this recording. You guys believed in building a business with me before any of this evidence was here. And um, you've become masters at your craft and everything that you shared today could change anyone's life if they'll take action on it. So I appreciate you and I'm looking forward to the next one. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Chad. All right. Thanks, everyone.